talk goes quite well with um, what you just heard, because a lot of this issue about conduct becoming criminalized, um, I sometimes think it's also about status. It's we're criminalizing um, conduct because of the status of a migrant. It's um, because an unauthorized immigrant is unable to get a work authorization, um, and then we then criminalize that, that conduct because it's coming from status. And so um, one of the questions that I kept thinking about when you were talking about um, this issue of, you know, we recognize that if we talk about considerations and benefits, that that also has consequences. Because we categorize people, we put people in boxes, and the question that remains, once we categorize a particular group, what we do with that information. And so when we start to see that we're expanding what criminal conduct is, one of the issues is why. Why are we expanding criminal conduct? And much of the reason, at least I argue um, in my scholarship, is based upon the fact that criminalization gives us the ability to other a particular group and then take away their um, resources or benefits by that label of being a criminal in and of, in and of themselves. So um, when I was asked about um, how inequity is a feature of immigration law, I must admit I had to chuckle because inequity is um, of the foundation of immigration law. Immigration law was um, created in order um, to ensure that who we wanted to be as a nation, right, those individuals who are coming to this country would actually be part of that um, part of that framework. And so as we know, like it or not, this country was created on the founding of the benefits were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And those who were from other countries, um, including for instance Mexico, which you know we'll talk about today, um, they were seen as inferior. Um, therefore, um, as we know, citizenship you had to be white in order to be granted citizenship. If you were not white, you could not. And so we have within immigration this legacy that continues about who we determine um, belongs and who should not belong. What are their benefits that they are going to contribute to our society? Um, and part of it was, you know, what is their race, what is their gender, um, as long as what is their work ethic, et cetera, et cetera. And so my scholarship lies in migration and crime policies. Um, many people have heard the word crimmigration. Um, and so I guess I'm a crimmigration scholar. And although I started out in uh, questioning how um, immigrate or the criminalization of immigration law started to influence the criminal justice system, I have turned to um, more issues of what impact race and racism have, if any, on migration and crime policies, and what migration and crime policies do to the racial identity or identity of certain groups, particularly Latinos, since they are the most effective, uh, affected by um, crime migration or crime and migration policies. And so, um, as many people know, we have the travel ban, and people will call it the Muslim ban. And in a few articles um, that I read, they brought back this issue of change head pain. How many know change head pain versus the United States? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, change head pain was actually the case that many say established what is the plenary power doctrine, um, saying that the executive and legislative branch have absolutely, absolute authority to determine um, immigration um, law, especially when it has to do with national. So um, in articles that you, um, I read, especially one by Mei Nagai, she talks about that Muslims are now the new Chinese. Chinese were the only racial group to be specifically identified as being excluded from this country in 1889. And so Chen Ping was actually, and it's not just any Chinese, it's Chinese laborers. And um, so we both have, we have race and we have class. <coughs> 
And so at the time, um, Congress enacted a law that prevented um, Chinese laborers from being, being able to enter the country. Um, and, but Mr. Um, King actually had, um, had been here for 12 years. And he wanted to go visit his family, so he asked for permission from the government. He got a certificate of return, um, and he left. And so on his way back, it's not like he could take a plane in the late 1800s, so he was on a ship back. And on um, October 1st, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act came, so preventing actually further um, Chinese laborers from being able to come into the country. He actually docked seven days later, and he was excluded from being able to come onto U.S. soil. He then argued um, that he should have a right to come back to the United States based upon um, several factors. One is the issue that there were treaties. Um, another issue was the fact that he had had permission, right? And how was he to know that while he was on, on the ocean, um, <coughs> the laws would change, and therefore he should be able to um, enter what it was his home, at least for 12 years. And actually, it was the Supreme Court um, at that point in his case that said no, um, that the authority of to be able to um, exclude individuals um, was the absolute power of the executive and legislative branch, and the judiciary could have no say in it. And, but what many people um, forget is that in the late 1800s, there was definitely um, a pushback on Chinese immigrants in general. There was, um, as we know, that uh, because of the gold rush, um, because of um, perceptions that they would not assimilate, that they were inferior, they were culturally inferior, that um, they were taking people's jobs, Americans' jobs, to be sort of, you know, have similarities now, um, that they should be excluded from coming. And so when we look at the, um, the language of Chai Chai King, I think this is one of the most um, important things that we should remember um, with the plenary um, doctrine or just in general about where this comes from. When um, Chai Chai King, it talks about to preserve its independence and its security against foreign aggression and encroachment is the highest duty of every nation. And to attain these ends, nearly all other considerations are to be subordinated. But then we see the language, it matters not in what form of aggression and encroachment comes, whether from the foreign nation acting in its national character or from vast hordes of its people crowning in upon us. The government possessing the powers which are to be exercised for protection and security, if the government of the U.S., through its legislative department, considers the presence of foreigners of a different race in this country who will not assimilate with us, to be dangerous to its peace and security, their exclusion is not to be stayed because at the time there is no actual hostility with this nation. And so when we look at the language of Chai Chen Ping and we see the reason for the court to determine that um, legislative and executive branch have the ultimate um, ability to exclude people, we also see that this racial animus comes through, that um, they brought, they may say it's based on national security, um, but yet the security that they define is enough that we feel that vast hordes of this different race who refuse to assimilate um, is enough to be able to classify them as dangerous, and dangerous to the peace and security of our nation. And so when we look at, um, what's been happening in the last 30 years with this question of migration and crime. Migrants in, this, in these last 30 years, the question is, what is a propensity to criminality? And as you can imagine, um, because of the vast increase of those who are now in detention or who are being deported as quote unquote criminal aliens, the rhetoric says, um, we know if we go into ICE, we know by languages, language in the last three years, and that, that goes to whether or not it's a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, a lot of it has to do with criminality, dangerousness, um, 
to our public safety, um, our national security, and um, you know, I will say that is our main priority to um, target those aliens who are a danger to national security and public safety of the utmost are criminal aliens. And when people think about criminal aliens, a lot of times they think about, okay, rapists, murderers, um, people who commit violent crimes. But when you look at the data, um, the majority of people who actually are considered now criminal aliens, um, and this came up during the Obama administration, is immigration violations, which are regulatory crimes. And as you already noticed, over 52% now it, that are being criminally prosecuted within the federal court system are um, immigration violations, which are not violent crimes. Um, they're not even considered regulatory crimes, but we can think of them as regulatory crimes. Um, Traffic violations was another one, and I still don't understand how that becomes um, a crime. I know there's not a lot of definition to it. They'll have a little asterisk and say DUI is, is, is considered into this, but not a lot of other information. And then drugs. And a lot of this comes from the war on drugs. And so um, we see that these three are not what we think about when we think about criminal aliens, except for the fact now immigration violators, those who entered the country without inspection, are prosecuted within the federal court system and now are um, considered with this thought of criminal aliens. And we see that especially um, with the new administration targeting um, unauthorized immigrants. And so when I started thinking about this inequity, I think about it in terms of being able to have an equity within immigration law now, within, especially within these last 30 years, based on this um, definition of dangerousness. But the definition goes back to, I believe, Che Chet King in the late 1800s, that we are able to cloak um, our own insecurities based on racial animus um, under this guise of um, protection and security. And why do I say there's a racial animus? Because um, in the last 30 years, what we see, right, the argument, or what we see of, for instance, 90% um, of, or 96% right now, of those that are removed from this country are Latino. And they come from five different countries. Mexico, Honduras, um, El Salvador, Guatemala, and which one did I miss? <coughs> this one. Um, I'll remember it in a second. And so mainly Mexico and Central America. The Dominican Republic, which is only half of an island, um, is actually sometimes ranks third, which I always find very interesting. But um, and so we know that 96% are Latino. We also know that of those, 96% um, that are removed as criminal aliens are also Latino. 90% um, that are in, um, de are in detention are Latino. So by far, the ma majority um, of people that are affected um, by immigration laws, or migration and crime policies are Latino. And so the question then becomes, is it because Latinos are more likely to cause crime? Um, is it a defect in their character? Or is there something else going on? Um, and as you can, as you heard even in um, Professor Rabat's um, talk, is the fact that we are increasingly criminalizing things that were not criminal before. Um, we have, in the last 30 years, been able to, um, based on migration and crime policies, we increased the numbers of crimes that became deportable offenses. We allowed it to be retroactive, so those individuals who had pled guilty, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years ago, when it wasn't a deportable offense, they became subject to deportation. Um, while we increased the number of crimes that became deportable offenses, we decreased the relief available in immigration law. And so even now, um, if they were, were subject to relief, um, they couldn't be anymore, and then we, we increased enforcement. And so a lot of these issues isn't about the fact that we have a higher um, 
the character of migrants that are coming to this country has a propensity towards crime, it's that we've changed the rules. And we've been able to say um, that based on changing the rules, it's because these individuals are a danger to our society and well-being, even if it's just for the sheer fact that they have crossed the border without um, permission, which is, right, against the rule of law. Although we know over 50% of those here without status are visa overstays. And so those individuals actually came to the United States with permission and then just never left. But we can't actually criminally prosecute them within federal court because there's no law that allows us to do that. Um, and so, again, when we talk about um, these disparities, especially racial, racial disparities within criminal um, immigration, I believe that we have to start looking um, to them or unpacking them, seeing them for what they are. And again, it goes to the issue of uh, Che Champagne's, the racial animus that was created by the plenary power doctrine, um, but can no longer remain, um, at least not so explicit, ever since 1965, the Civil Rights Act forbid um, discrimination on the basis of and ethnicity, and instead we have race neutral laws, but are still cloaked with race, racial animus. And at that point, I know we only have 20 minutes left, so I'm going to stop. Um, and I'm also going to um, say that even though um, questions were asked in the first talk, that I think they, these two flow quite well together. And so if you have further questions uh, for the first talk as well, I uh, heard only one bright line in all of this presentation, and that was the military service. Oh, Everything else you. seemed to be individual by individual by individual, and no, no attention seemed to be paid to the administrative problems that such a system would involve. We're talking about 11 to 14 million people, and uh, with the present uh, staff that, that we have, it would seem like it would take 50 or 60 years to process them through such a procedure as has been outlined here. Uh, I, I, I just wonder if, if we shouldn't be uh, considering a more generalized way of dealing with the, the question of deportation. Um, well, the other thing about the military service is they've just actually put a halt on any military service for even lawful permanent residents. Anyone who's not a non who is not a U.S. citizen, um, they have said can no longer uh, serve <coughs> for the military, and that was just the last it was like last week. Mm -hmm. So well, even that is not a bright line. Yes, um, and it was interesting. I don't know if many people know um, there <coughs> were two points of mass. Um, in our history. One was um, Mexican repatriation, and the other one was Operation Wetback. Yes, it is what the name was. And so it not, that took place in 1929 um, and also for a period in 1954. Um, they estimate, I think the highest estimate is that they were able to deport 2 million individuals, is on the high side but they do admit that almost 50% of them were actually U.S. citizens. And so, um, and my grandmother is 96, and she actually remembers both times. And she says um, the first time she was about seven years old, and so her friends were being deported with their parents and were told, oh, don't worry, you can come back when you're 18, um, which isn't really true, but anyway. Um, and even then, there were only 2 million people when we have 14 million. It, it's true. It's, it's going to be impossible to be able to remove that many people. It's also impossible to remove that many people when you're actually targeting um, at the southwest border unauthorized immigrants. And we already know that the vast majority are visa overstays. So there are people who had visas. Um, they didn't come through the border in the same way. So it's not going to work. Um, so, I mean, some people have proposed that you should, 
that target visa overstays as well. Um, and they're trying to get a system, they've announced they're trying to crack down and create some kind of system that will track visa overstays. I don't know if that will actually happen. Um, I think the question remains to me um, is if we are going to enforce some kind of deportation or removal regime, and it is truly based on dangerousness, um, or it is truly um, based on criminal factors, that um, traffic violations, unauthorized immigration, um, and even some drug crimes, um, maybe that's not the best route to go. And I would love to see immigration back in immigration and the criminal justice system back in the criminal justice system and then go from there. Um, but I think right now, in the last 30 years, I do really think that we're in an ad hoc situation where everyone is fair game which includes, unfortunately, U.S. citizens um, who are mistakenly targeted for foreigners. Is a statistical approach valid? You, you, know, you mentioned that 96% were these kind of fuzzy people, but say you said we're going to, 4% of the 14 million are going to get deported, and we'll figure out how to, how to deport 4%. Would that be a legitimate way of doing it? You know, that, that is a good, that's a good question. I do think that if there was a way to target a particular group of people that we could agree were dangerous to, to national security and public safety, um, I probably would agree with that. I think the problem is, and I think that's one of the issues that we just even started talking about, is definitions of equity, definitions of dangerousness and threats to public, security, of public safety are also very ambiguous. And I think we need a better definition than we have because I don't think we're targeting the right people. If we're saying we're, tar we're supposed to target violent offenders or true, the most dangerous to our public safety and national security, we're not doing that now. And so I think that's my strongest argument, my, my argument to, to why I do the work I do. If I could just jump in and can respond to both of your questions. So first, I think I agree that we need to create some measure of rule, e easily administrable rules around who gets to stay and who gets to, you know, who's doesn't fall within the category of people who will receive the protection. And I think that's started to happen under the Obama administration with DACA. I mean, that's one example of a program where we had a set of rules, but there was, but the challenge is um, finding societal consensus around what the criteria should be, right? So DACA, I think there generally is consensus, but then there was, of course, the legal issue around whether or not it was properly executed, but executive branch and it should have gone through notice and comment and the same challenge was successfully raised against the subsequent program with the parents. Uh, so I, you know, I think that those things have value and they create a, a more easily administratable system where you're kind of just funneling people through some basic criteria and then you said, okay, if you check these boxes, you can stay. Um, but you know, to your second question around, you know, can we just identify this 14 million, so we're going to take X percent. I mean, the challenge is that with, obviously this is a, 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 in some respects really obvious, but the it, the migrant community is so deeply integrated in different ways, economically, so, socially, right? And that we have to make some, we have to identify what are the criteria, right? Is it the dangerousness that the people with X kind of convictions were just not even going to. Uh, look beyond the conviction and just say, you're not worthy, right? But then how do we weigh the other ways in which they are contributing to society? And I think in particular, the economic integration is something that's gotten a lot of traction, is so many of these individuals are deeply integrated into our economies, and you know, many of the non-citizens who are here without authorization came into the country in the late 90s, early 2000s, so they've been here for a substantial period of time. So they're fairly integrated into the labor market. And so then extracting them at this point may have other corollary uh, harmful effects right, in our system. So it's, it's hard to... It seems to me like we're looking for some kind of a broad-axe approach to this. But that's what's really required. 
if we are going to substantially reduce this number. Now, you cannot do it on an individual by individual basis. Uh, you might say, for example, that we're going to give uh, amnesty or whatever to everybody over 60 years old. Very few of those people will be criminals or will uh, present a criminal threat to the, to the United States. Uh, you give them, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there are arguments that they will continue to consume and the rest of us will have to pay for their uh, Medicare and so forth, but uh, uh, that would be one way of dealing with part of the criminal issue. I don't know how the demographics break down. I think the principal criterion that's been advanced in policies now is just duration, right? So if you've been here for a certain period of time, right, people can have disagreements about how long it is, but let's say you've been here for 20 years. And in fact, there's a provision in our immigration law. Registry. Yeah, <laughs> called registry, which is basically the concept that basically if you don't have any serious criminal conduct and you're just here for a certain period of time, you automatically become a green card. The problem is that the registry date is 1972, isn't it? So right now, it's set at, I think, 45 years. Like yeah, which is an exceptionally long period of time. And there's been a move, which is not going to get anywhere, but it would be a very easy legislative fix along the lines of what you're suggesting. Let's say we move the registry date to 1995, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe 2000. That would mean anyone who's been here since 2000, who pretty much has had a clean record, can get a green card. And it's already in the statute. As a pathway to a green card, we just need to change the date. But Congress thus far has not seen fit to change that date, and it's now sitting at typically in the country almost 45, 50 years to benefit. You know, to create an easy mechanism for accomplishing what you intend to Okay. I have a question for the first presenters. I find that your general argument really persuasive, but I'm a member of the state legislature, and a lot of my colleagues are people who would be very willing to sacrifice the common good in service of their version of equity, which is making sure that nobody gets anything that they don't deserve. And of course, in their view, an undocumented immigrant is somebody who doesn't deserve anything. And so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how to present your ideas to people who are willing to. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think one thing that I think is really important is just language, seriously, and, and use the word undocumented immigrant, which is much better than I'm sure the language they would use. But again, that's not what separate buttons are. Which would be, which would probably be the preferred, um, maybe criminal alien, but I think that's um, an important uh, framework to use to start off with, that these people are undocumented, and, and Professor Hoski has also talked about this, of that, um, either they overstayed their visa or they cross the border, which in my mind though is criminalized in a statute, it's not a criminal act. Um, and uh, I think presenting it that way is to, you know, unfortunately I, I think it's a, it's a bigger issue to change the way people perceive folks who have criminal convictions. So I think the, the challenge for you is, is maybe is kind of separating people who are undocumented from that big uh, sort of criminal bubble. Um, so I think just using that language and um, emphasizing that a number of these people also have connections to the community, family, um, many years in the United States. I think a lot of you may have views on this too, but I think the biggest challenge for, for countering those positions is how do you effectively persuade people that this quote-unquote original sin of either entering them illegally or overseeing your visa should be given less weight, right? Because it's grown exponentially in importance in the political rhetoric and in people's minds, such to the point that it's almost unforgivable. But when we think about any other body of law, administrative law or criminal law, like this is an administrative violation and it's a misdemeanor. Right. It could be charged either way, just depending on like, the attitude of the officer on a given day, right? And in any other body of law, those kinds of administrative violations or misdemeanors can be counterbalanced by other factors. Like, there may be a penalty associated with it, but it shouldn't be the death penalty, right? Like, and that's the analogy that I give to people is, 
if you commit a, an administrative violation or a misdemeanor criminal law, you're not going to get given the death penalty. But that's essentially the argument that's being made in the immigration space is that what is effectively an administrative or relatively minor immigration violation, the only appropriate penalty in the minds of some is the most extreme penalty, which is deportation. I mean, that's the logic that I use. It doesn't always work. Thanks. But I think that's the beauty of the issue of criminalizing unauthorized entry into the United States at this point, or at least the, the ability to say you have committed a crime because now they're criminals. It's no, it doesn't become, it's no longer just a civil violation. And a lot of people um, conflate the fact that it's the entry, even if it was 10, 20 years ago, that's a violation. It's not their existence in this country, but yet many people think there, there's a continued trespass. And if we think about that in criminal law, there's very many, very little um, offenses that have a, a no statute of limitation. And for an immigration violation to have no statute of limitation, it didn't always start out like that. It used to be, as long as you weren't caught within the first year, you couldn't be deported. And then it was five years, and now it's, you know, you could, I could catch you 40 years from now, right? You just missed registry by, you know, five years. Um, that adverse possession almost trespass uh, theory, and I can still deport you, even if you have U.S. citizen children and a family and have worked all your life and paid into Social Security. Um, but none of that matters. And I think sometimes um, what matters is if people actually know other people who are in that situation and never knew it. And that also goes to social psychology, is that um, once we actually know people who this is of impacting, um, people start to have different thoughts about what we should do. And so if you can find somebody who had it, who is like a great um, person, right, goes back to contributions and deserving, then a lot of times people will have a different opinion about it. But I mean, I do think that the criminalization of unlawful entry and criminalizing more um, offenses and, you know, the political debates about it are beautiful in terms of being able to ensure that people will have a negative opinion about a certain group of people. Not that I think it's good, I just think it's... That's true. Exactly. Anyone have any additional questions? We have about five minutes left. Has there been any uh, study of the uh, relationship of uh, freedom of religion and uh, refusal to assimilate? It seems to me that those two concepts may be directly in conflict with one another. It's interesting with this theory of assimilation. Um, and even in Che Chen King, we know that you know, part of the issue was they won't assimilate. But when we look at the history, um, to be quite honest, this country wouldn't let them assimilate. There was segregation. Um, you know, there was, and and when we think about it in terms of, of um, particularly Latinos now in the U.S., the argument is they don't assimilate. They still speak Spanish. But when you look at research, they actually say that they assimilate at a faster rate. Um, than other, um, whether you want to call it race or ethnicity, what they have done that's different is that they have also kept their, their original language. So they are bilingual for more than maybe one, one generation. Um, and so it's not that people aren't assimilating in the, into this country, um, but you're right, assimilation is very important in immigration law. And so the question is, is there research on the issue between assimilation and freedom of religion? Um, I don't know of any at all. Which what I think would be different between, for instance, most Latinos are Catholic. So. Um. It's interesting because I think uh, when we talk about religious minorities and concerns about religious minorities who are immigrating to the US, US there is some discussion about uh, assimilation. 
concerns, but of course in the context of the Muslim community, a lot of the fr framing is around dangerousness. Um, so studies I'm not aware of, but it would be interesting. It's, what, what's interesting, however, just as a feature of immigration policy is that religious uh, freedom is a core pillar of our refugee policy in so far as kind of the US government prioritizes religious minorities, right, who are persecuted overseas. And religious, international religious freedom, they even created a commission specifically for this, which is relatively unique, right? This US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And they conduct studies of countries to look at where there are religious minorities being persecuted. And then those minorities often become those individuals who are brought in through our US refugee program. And that's something that's been consistent across administrations. So there's a certain irony there in the sense that, at least we've seen in some of the actions and statements out of the White House, either directly or indirectly, that there's concerns about particular religious groups, but at the same time, a consistent feature of US immigration policy has been to promote religious diversity and freedom. Now, whether it has corollary impacts in society, I don't think that's been studied, at least through the immigration plan. Thank you all, and we will take a about 10 minute break, and then